I think a lot of investors out there who have taken a position uh, over the last year and a half in Hylion is probably in the same boat as me. And I think it's uh, constructive to continue to strike up a uh, discussion uh, in a manner that offers as many perspectives as we can possibly render and bring to the table on what we are faced with here uh, as an industry, uh, not with a company who's struggling in the stock price. Okay. Um, I listened to the last earnings call, and I think before we get into the analysis, I would recommend that each and every one of you get a hold of the conference call and stick around for what I found to be uh, one of many very telling elements of, of the last conference call uh, to close out Q2 2021. So that does close out the first half of 2021 here um, and, and lends us entering into Q3, Q4 2021 uh, to close out what has been a, a pretty pretty poor year for the stock. Okay. Now, when I put out my deliberation, I do so to aim for uh, value, usefulness to anyone out there who either owns the stock or is more interested in the space in general. Uh, Hylion is a, a participant in um, the electrification of class eight chassis. It's intriguing. And you don't need to have me regurgitate the specifics of the company, but here's the thing. I think I'm probably not alone in that I listened to the conference call and I was actually uh, very satisfied. I was. I was satisfied when I got through the about one hour um, uh, offering from Hylion, um, especially some of the specifics that we'll get into on this video, discuss my specific opinion on, on some of the things that I was very encouraged by. Now, over the coming days, the stock price just took a nosedive. And I, I really can't put my finger on why that is. I really can't. I, I think it may be necessary to chalk that up as par for the course for this company. Anybody who's invested in this company above $10 a share has not made any money at all. Um, does that mean that they're not ever going to sell product to fleets? I, I, I think that there's so many influences out there, one of which I was able to come across here. And the title of the article was highly on the product has a problem. And as you read through the article, I do highly encourage you to go on. I do invite differing opinions, certainly, and, and don't, don't mean to be part of a, a, a fanboy club on Hylion. I will disclose up front that I'm actually a Hylion bull. Uh, I'm actually a proud stock owner in the company and will continue to be. There will be no element of shakeout with regard to my shares because I know how much this will mean to me as a retail investor who's done his due diligence. And as the months and the quarters go by, you start to forget, as, as anybody would, um, what it is that was declared on the onset, even back into the SPAC merger process and then entering into the public domain as a publicly traded company. You start to second guess some of those things and say, did I review that correctly? You know, my bullish thesis was built around uh, the due diligence that I picked up through the investor presentations, of course, that have all been submitted to the SEC. Um, you can go to highlyon.com and pick out the newest one. I've saved all of the investor presentations uh, from years past or months past as this thing has rolled out over the last going on a couple of years here now uh, in the Hylion story. But I have to go back and I have to review some of that information uh, just to refresh my bullish th thesis and, and really uh, validate for myself if things have changed. I want to bring your guys' attention to the very, very first investor presentation that came out. And this is really where I hope to strike some value because where there is a, a ton of different articles out there. I think some are really split and neutral on uh, highly on right now with regard to their 
uh, opportunity going forward. But you, you really need to look at this and simplify what it is that we're looking at for the future of trucking, okay? Our fleet's going to be able to tra make the transition from a, uh, a diesel-dominated industry to something that can be more strategically applied to their routes uh, as appropriate. And I'm very careful with my wording here and understanding that Hylion doesn't need to take over the trucking industry to succeed, okay? As we'll show in this original uh, investor presentation and timeline, um, these guys have done nothing but remain steadfast in their timelines declared to shareholders um, and all, also the um, additional uh, elements that were not disclosed in, in some of these uh, uh, preliminary filings with the SEC and made available to would-be investors publicly uh, that... Um, that has occurred over the over the last uh, few months anyway in identifying some necessary upgrades to specifically the hybrid product uh, and then just the elective improvements to the hyper truck erx project and and really becoming the dominant uh, forefront product to be offered uh, to strategically be put in the market specifically in california uh, to address the the uh, uh, fuel energy credits out there and, and make sure that those um, those logistics elements can be happened because right now um, they really do stand the risk of making um, uh, of an inability to transport uh, based on regulatory oversight there. So uh, the problem being the pollution here, and, and it just speaks to what we've always talked about here. But I did, I always read something different in these when I go across these and it really got my attention. Yeah, we, we know that 86% of the companies are looking for a solution. 96% are part of the Paris Agreement here. Um, so, you know, the, the real go for me is, is when they fight through this very difficult U.S. market because we want to scrutinize and we have the ability to short a good company like this uh, and all is fair in an open market, right? Um, but once the, those things get resolved and the short squeeze uh, gets rid of some of that activity uh, in the open market, we'll be looking to um, get a small share of the domestic market and then move globally. And I think that's really the bread and butter for Hylion. And I also don't think that it gets talked about uh, enough. But one thing that caught my attention here was 80% of the consumers uh, are demanding a, a cleaner future and are, are educated on who those uh, polluters uh, of the earth are and, and who it is they feel have responsible environmental stewardship scores. It's, it's even coming to a, a point where investors are actually considering, as I do, um, the investor uh, or the environmental score and taking that into consideration as one of the criteria to factor into the deliberation of whether or not you do or do not take a position in a specific company. So these are always important to go back and re-review here on, on the statistics of, of what the problem is, what's the demand right now. And Thomas Healy talks about the bridge work that is happening between Hylion uh, Holdings Company and these companies out there that are sitting down at the table and talking about number one addressed on the call was TCO, total cost of ownership, which I found really interesting. There's some schools of thought out there that the Hypertruck ERX is actually too expensive. If you look at it in a... Um, in a one uh, angle type of perspective and draw that conclusion compared to one specific element, that may be true. But when you look at it in its totality over the cost of, of a seven year total cost of ownership, it becomes very, very clear that the additional horsepower, the additional payload, uh, and, and the ability to uh, reduce carbon emissions all at the same time really do have uh, kind of a, 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 culm, a, a, a cumulative value to um, the, uh, the fleet operators of these trucks. So very, very important to understand that. So as, as you go back through these presentations here, I think it's really important for you to 
continue to uh, refresh yourself on on these um, these specifics here. Now, one of the things that Thomas Healy talked about on the call is the actual engagement with industry and really trying to frame the highly on opportunity as not being a product that's needing to be sold to to industry. OK, and I think it's interesting. Um, he was asked specifically or he just electively said, I think it was one of the analysts at the end of the uh, Q&A session that asked him, what what are fleets asking you? What are they telling you that they need? And it came down to the three criteria, and th these are some that I've earmarked as well along the way, reliability. In other words, if you took 100 diesel trucks and you ran them at full capacity uh, under load across the United States and back over and over again, would it be safe to say or safe to presume that the Hypertruck ERX would at least perform on par with the diesel with regard to the reliability? Only reliability when we're looking at this. In other words, are those 100 trucks going to still be running and we're going to have Hypertruck ERXs on the sideline uh, being repaired for unforeseen and unproven technology reasons, right? This is this is key. Reliability is going to be key. And dare I say, the Hypertruck ERX is going to have to perform on par at least with how reliable diesel engines have been. Now, it this is irrespective of the carbon footprint. This is irrespective of the driver experience. But when we're talking about reliability and talking about freight liners putting hard dollars to work in the investment, they have to be able to bet on putting those trucks on the road and making sure that there is a certainty that they can complete those routes um, on time and they can complete them with reliability. So some things that um, Hylion has done with regard to the uh, um, um, the reliability of the product has really just been to revamp uh, the, the hybrid unit specifically. Now, the, the Hypertruck ERX improvements with the plug-in and the 75 miles of additional range to be eligible for the fuel credits, that came out of left field. That's something that I was not expecting at all. It was a pleasant surprise, one of many, that Hylion continues to pleasantly surprise with positive information. And I guess I'm a little bit stuck here with having to deploy an extreme amount of discipline on the stockholding side of it when I know, in fact, <coughs> excuse me, the improvements uh, at the company itself have been extremely uh, positive uh, and they've been impressive to be honest with you so interesting enough with the reliability the second being uh, cost effective thomas healy again mentioned this when sitting down with fleets and making sure that the tco over time uh, paid off right yes that carbon footprint reduction and making sure that the total score for environmental uh, impact is at least hitting that neutral category for most of uh, the companies out there. And the Hypertruck ERX being a net carbon negative when run off of RNG, right, can absolutely do that. In other words, a company doesn't have to be total net carbon negative across the board. They may have some pollutive uh, elements of their of their business that they can't change, but the Hypertruck ERX can really be that solution to help mitigate and get that company closer to the net neutral that we're looking to achieve. The, the last thing is what I would want to ask Thomas Healy on, which I don't have a lot of granularity on, just little tidbits of third-party reports coming back about the driver experience. I think this is going to be an interesting piece because where owners will set up the ability to run the rigor through on reliability and then determine uh, with pen and paper the bottom line cost effectiveness TC over, over the course of the, the truck's lifespan, it's really going to come down to that third tier, whether or not the drivers enjoy 
uh, the Hypertruck ERX experience and actually driving these trucks is the uh, extra power, uh, is the extra torque, is it put to good use, is the quiet ride worth it? You know, in my experience, a lot of old school, right, they don't like to change. They like the growl of that diesel engine, right? I'm, I'm one of them. So I, I'm, I'm really interested in this element of this, and this will unfold in the coming months um, with the Hypertruck Innovation Council as they start to get the demo units into the fleets and getting these units in the hands of some of their drivers. Now, this is going to be a sample size, right? So I think they're probably going to put them into the hands of a, a, a diverse sample size, I would imagine. So that new drivers and older drivers that have seniority have an ample shot uh, at, at putting in to put these to the rigor of over the road from the driver's perspective. I, I think those three elements that Thomas Healy talked about really helped provide some granularity around the specifics that are happening at the tables between Hylion Holdings and the, the fleet operators. I, I thought that was key, and I really appreciated that uh, as a shareholder to be offered. I, I think interesting enough, I think the hybrid um, product, both on the diesel hybrid and the CNG product, are, are really, really mistaken a lot of the time in the industry. And I, I don't mean to presume um, that I know everything about Hylion Holdings. I've read every, every SEC document. I've ev read every word on their website, if you are a stock owner in the company with some significance, this is active investing and this is how it's done. So if you haven't done your ample due diligence, um, I, I would highly encourage you to start with at least the presentations that have been submitted and then to make sure that you fully understand um, the, um, the hybrid product, which I think unfortunately gets a bad rap. Interestingly enough, I think a lot of people want to just jump to the hyper, uh, hyper truck ERX and just believe that that's going to be um, the end all be all solution in, in, in the future. Okay. But I want to remind you guys something that really came to my mind that, um, that really caught my attention. I want to scroll through here and see if I can't find this slide here and talk about it a little bit. Um, this was part of it with the OEMs that were uh, involved in it. But, but I want to cruise. There's the total cost of ownership there at 279,776, taking into consideration the totality of the ownership over seven years, right? Savings versus diesel. Now that's total savings, right? That's assuming that the payload, the additional mileage traveled, you know, not to mention, I don't even know how you'd quantify driver experience. Uh, but I think across the board, I, I think this is a very, very telling number when, when you're when you're stacked up against the known competition in the industry. And look, the article that was posed highly on the product has a problem uh, by Mr. Stephen Tobin. Um, it was uh, marked as an, a neutral article. And I, I found that interesting because it was pretty, uh, pretty scathing in that uh, Mr. Tobin was basically saying that highly will not sell product. Um, I, I think that's a stretch. Uh, I think it takes a lot of imagination. I, I think it's a very, very vague comment to make that statement um, in that Hylion in and of itself has basically proposed we, we don't need to do that. Um, their original sales calculation um, was based on uh, an anticipation uh, anticipated uh, addressable market grab of just over 2%. Um, for every hundred trucks that are turned out through the rotation and back to Thomas Healy's call spoke about this four year rotation, which I really appreciated this as well to understand that fleets are putting in new orders for trucks every four every year and then rotating out the old trucks at the end of the four year life cycle. Right. It speaks to the reliability curve. They have data on all this stuff that shows um, that it's most reliable along its life cycle um, at a certain point to start to look to renew those fleets. And four years was that magic number. Hylion's not looking to come in there and, and, and grab 100% of their business. Now, do I, do I presume that maybe Hylion stands a good chance of even grabbing more than 2%? I do. 
But I do think it's a far cry to say that Hylion will never sell a product to the fleets, which was really um, the essence of the article that was put through. And if you read it closely, there is certainly a disclosure at the end of it, which will tell you, uh, like in most cases, these um, uh, writers that are coming out, uh, unfortunately, do have an agenda. If you can accuse me of having an agenda uh, on Hylion, it is that I want to see the company succeed. Um, if my stock goes up because of that as a stock owner, well, I, I declare to you at the top of the video that I am indeed a highly on bull uh, and have a significant position in this company. But if this company succeeds, the world will be better off for it. And I'd like to think that by nature of large scale fleet adoption, the fleets are better off for it as well as the drivers. Uh, and, and as well as our transportation uh, system going forward uh, to become robust is the cost of uh, a, a, a hypertruck ERX with advanced technology. Does it have the potential on the onset to have a higher sticker price than diesel? Certainly, we're moving out of a century old industry uh, of just blowing smoke into the atmosphere. And if we're going to step into a new world of technology, then there has to be some acknowledgement to the uh, upfront cost that may be associated to integrate the new technology into the fleet. And I just want to cruise th through here because I want to show you guys what I'm talking about uh, with regard to the hybrid electric. And this is something that a lot of investors may have overlooked on the onset. But look here, guys, deployed with customers today. This investor presentation, if I'm not mistaken, came out May of 2020. Um, here we are in August of 2021. Uh, these hybrid products have been deployed with Wegmans, Penske, Ryder. You'll uh, identify with some of those, of course, uh, as they are all part of the Innovation Council. Idealese, if you hadn't forgotten, was also one of the fleets that was earmarked in one of the press releases that Hylion had. The other ones that caught my attention here with EGL, Eagle, and CR England, if you pay attention to over-the-road trucking, uh, those are some of the folks that are out there uh, quite significantly. Um, they have had the hybrid product uh, in place this entire time. Now, where do you think the source of the feedback and the requirement to uh, sharpen these products came from? It came from here. These are the very customers right here that have provided the feedback to say, here's what worked, here's what needed to be improved upon. And this is exactly what is going on right now with Hylion. They talked about this on the call. Sherry Baker talked about the immaterial uh, earnings from 2021 here uh, being immaterial. I want to get to that pro proposal and show you guys that I don't think that they were that far off when they originally wrote this. Now, that, it, that was based on fleet size uh, and data extrapolation to say, look, you know, this is what we can assume we're going to be able to make. And I think it was a, an educated guess at the time of doing the investor presentation. I think what is the most impressive to me is that Hylion hits the stuff kind of on the nose. And, and I think when we get to the um, the element, there's the cost breakdown of the, hy the hybrid system here. But in, in the article, they talked about the diesel solution as not being an environmentally friendly initiative. And I, I just couldn't disagree more. And, and, and I don't mean to blame Mr. Tobin. By his admission, he does not own stock in Hylion. He does own stock in a competitor to Hylion, which was probably some of the basis for the article. Uh, I would like to think that it was put out um, with uh, some... Um, you know, in, in, in a well-intentioned way. Um, unfortunately, anymore, you almost have to take everything that you read uh, and consume on social media and the greater internet at face value and really not read too much into it. In other words, I'm not going to sell all my stock because Mr. Tobin says that the product has a problem and furthermore, will never sell to a fleet. I find that extremely imaginative uh, on his part based on what we know about the product 
and what we know about fleets that have already purchased the product and have uh, provided the positive feedback. But the the hybrid diesel solution um, and, and the APU fuel, fuel savings uh, enough right there is uh, uh, an environmental initiative right there to reduce um, the um, uh, the effects of, of idling that, that's necessary when uh, the cabin is turned to a hotel feature for the um, for the driver. But I do want to cruise down here and I do want to talk a little bit about this financial slide. Uh, here's the timeline. And, and this is another element of, of you guys. And, and the greater um, bearish thesis on the stock is that somehow Hylion is not, you know, not racing towards sales. If you t if you look at this testing and validation, it's absolutely in line. Fleet de demo rollout right there toward Q3, Q4, into Q4, and into to 2020, 22. Man, if I'm reading this correctly, if they can get fleet and demo rollouts done by Q4, 2021, man, they're ahead of schedule. Now, the conference call talked about fleet and demo rollout into 2022, which may extend that that time frame. But but good grief is the expectation to be early on time or or late. It's going to be one of those. And by this time frame, they called it to be complete by Q4 and have those uh, hyper truck ERXs in the hands of the fleets now. The testing and validation of the original hybrid product has been in the hands of the aforementioned uh, uh, companies, Wegman, Penske, Ryder, Idea, Lee's, Eagle Transport, CR England, EGL, uh, all this time. A and that product is going to be finalized and ready for rollout in 2021, later half. We've, we've only went through half of 2021 here. So we've got Q3 and Q4 to see what type of interest can be garnered on the hybrid product, both on the diesel side and on the CNG side. You need to understand the difference between those two. One is a diesel uh, savings initiative and the CNG option uh, through the hybrid product is uh, additional horsepower, okay? As the infrastructure exists now to power our CNG fleet, the power just does not exist uh, for our class eights to do heavier loads without the assistance of the hybrid CNG product. So unlike a lot of people out there that just don't understand the hybrid product, which was indicated by some of the Q&A that we got from, look, some really freaking smart people, um, if they're really that interested in asking a question, I would encourage them to go back through the Hylian website because it lays it out uh, very explicitly on what they're looking to do with, with that hybrid product. Okay. Um, interesting enough to review here. I'd love for them to grab a relationship with the, with JB Hunt uh, and Swift. Uh, these are some. Now Schneider's on the Innovation Council. DHL is not. Amazon, UPS are not. Coca Cola, right? FedEx. So you know some of this when this was written up initially, and things that I looked over when I initially looked at this was the FEV relationship, um, which has been solidified. So nothing but granular nuggets in here to pull out on what Hylion has done. We cruise over to the financials again, and this is this is one of those slides that I've earmarked many, many times. I think it's very, very important to understand here if we're looking at 2021 year's end here, 2021 here revenue estimated at 8 million. Okay. Now, if Sherry Baker is considering 8 million uh, as um, uh, immaterial, I, I would totally agree with that assessment. I I do. I, I think that uh, we're probably looking at a burn rate here of 130, 140 million dollars to uh, yearly to operate the company. I, I, I think that's kind of where we comfortably sit. Um, the words that came out of Sherry Baker's mouth talking about uh, Hylion being a very, very capital uh, um, uh, intensive light business. And in other words, they don't have to have a lot of infrastructure in place to make these things work with the integration of the installs at the OEMs uh, and how the Austin plant is going to be kind of the central nerve system for uh, all things ago with Hylion Holdings. I, I I looked at this and I thought they're they're right on schedule. And, and this is what I initially thought when I took the the call. And at the end of it, I I was very very positive. And then just to see the stock go down the next day and the next day really kind of put me into well maybe maybe there was a, a neutral overtone to the call. 
uh, even though the tone that I got from uh, Sherry Baker on the financial element and the uh, uh, prepared marks uh, by Thomas Healy were extremely positive. I, I did not sense in any fashion at all that they weren't excited to take this thing uh, to the trade shows at the end of August and into September it's, as it's the hyper truck is going to be uh, showcased at, at some trade shows here uh, within the coming weeks. I, I got nothing but positive out of that um, th that element. I really think something that investors miss, if not the writers, is it's 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 all or nothing. It's Hylion needs to dominate and take over the industry. And this is something that I will ask Thomas Healy about if he's a guest on the channel. And the, the question will be framed in a way that Hylion does not need to dominate the Class 8 space. They, they don't. Um, these statistics are garnered from a 2% a, a market share win for Hylion. That is it. A, a, every two out of 100. Now, it, look, level with me, guys, and just be rational about this application for two freaking seconds. Are you honestly telling me that the Hypertruck Innovation Council isn't going to justify after their validation of the demo units and the integration it, it does occur. This is where my investment thesis takes part. If you're going to be bearish on Hylion, you need to you need to be very bull, bearish on this element that fleets are going to get the demo units and they're not going to like the solution. OK, that's what's going to happen if Hylion has trouble in the integration into uh, the, the four year uh, life cycle rotation of the, the fleets. OK, when they're making new orders, I, I don't think that's going to happen. I really don't. I think Hylion has done enough both proactively internally and with collaboration with industry and with the multiple meetings, uh, quotes from Thomas Healy that has been held uh, since the Innovation Council was uh, uh, was incepted uh, to make me believe that we're marching in a direction that these fleets are going to integrate, which is something that I've always contended as uh, being really the end all be all of the bear bullish case. Okay. It's either one or the other is going to happen. Either they don't and the and the bearish thesis wins out uh, or they do integrate uh, to whatever scale is worth discussing uh, on the bullish side. Now this reflects only a 2%, uh, just over 2% market penetration on these figures here going into 2022 where the revenue is expected to jump up to 344 million uh and then uh, uh 2023 years end up to over a billion of uh, of realized revenue uh and then the ebitda revenue you see there on the bottom line jumps to 214 million now we're talking now we're getting into a very interesting solution that it, it, again, if you think that Hylion has all this good momentum going, a good team behind it, uh, working through this, working through um, their commercialization with their new ad addition to their uh, communicate uh, uh, commercialization chief, that was also declared on the call, which I thought was a, a very, very important element to really get down into the granular, how the OEMs are going to accept orders. Uh, what the cost of uh, materials is going to be, and and how that's going to play out, and and what that how how that's going to affect that EBITDA uh, revenue, because that that's the important element right there is protecting that in the 2024 category, the 602 million uh, that's projected into 2024. Okay, so very very important to review the original statistics. Okay, very very important there. Uh, to, to understand uh, and look at what what it is we're looking at um, over the course of the next three years uh, with Hylion. Very, very important to understand. And I, I think in closing, I think I forced myself to come up with some some issues, okay? As, as such a bull, I don't want to get into this habit of, of, of you know, spearheading a, a group think or a, you know, a, a chat group that's that's really blinded by the risks that exist here with Hylion. I don't consider the fact that it's a pre-revenue company a risk. You can either choose to invest on that or not. Okay. We all know that it's a pre-revenue company. 
but it's working on some very, very monumental things. But some of the things that were mentioned during the call, I will earmark for your benefit now. These are some of the things that I really thought stuck out to me. Um, the delay based on the chip shortage, okay? That's real. And I think Thomas Healy did an okay job of addressing it, uh, basically stating that they are, uh, he didn't say hoping, but anticipating that those chip shortages would work themselves out on the initial rollout of the hybrid system in the back half of this year and those uh, systems start to be delivered to fleets, okay? Now, he did talk about the workarounds by the Hylion team there, and I, I don't doubt that there was probably some, um, some creative thinking, some strategic problem solving to identify um, some of the components that would work to allow those systems to remain a go, okay? But that's not quite good enough for me as a shareholder. If there are uh, best available chips out there by some of the most reputable manufacturers that are necessary in the supply chain for the Hylion product, and they, they need to make sure that those are open and flowing. And the presumption was that those supply chains would end up working it out. We're just going through a very rough patch right now and by Thomas Healy's admission, that's actually part of why some of the delay occurred, okay? I think the number one driver behind the delay was actually product improvement. And he talked about some of that product improvement initiative in some of the cold weather applications, uh, some of the reliability uh, issues, and then uh, finally the ease of install at the OEMs. Th th these are discussions that I think are not happening with some of the other companies out there that I actually do spend some time listening to and say, well, am I getting too too far along this neon green path that I'm walking with highly on? And I'm all I always come back to the very um, the very unique discussions that are going on. They're very, very real discussions that are happening at the granular level. What is the discussion going on with fleets? What do fleets want? Do you have the ability to, to show them bottom dollar the benefit? Can the solution be put into place right now? And I think the, the overwhelming uh, answers to those questions, Hylion has done a really quite, uh, done quite a good job in, in addressing so I, I think that really kind of covers the, the call itself. I would encourage each and every one of you guys to go and listen to the call all the way through the Q&A. Um, Mark Delaney, my favorite analyst of, of Hylion, who's still got an $8 price target on the stock. He may end up being right, but I think it's ironic. I've already submitted my second complaint to the SEC for stock manipulation. I have. Because I think it's really unfortunate that where the market gains favor on a company or where a company has been shorted for re uh, uh, realistic reasons, I think that's fair. I think my problem is when those shorting initiatives or those stock um, um, analyst ratings come out and then the company behind the scenes does something completely contrary to that recommendation that's forward leaning to the public. I think that's extremely misleading and I really don't think there's a place for it. I think there needs to be a moratorium. Uh, between the time that a recommendation is coming out, if you want to come out and put a sell rating on the stock and put an $8 price target, then your company has to stand by that for, let's say, eh, 30 days. Nice round number out there. And that way you're forced to stand by your, your, your number. And that moratorium doesn't exist now. So you can say whatever you want, and then the very next business day, do something completely contrary in, uh, to what it is that you recommended. And I think that's really unfortunate. I think the vast majority of retail investors are put at a disadvantage because they don't have the time in the market of somebody like myself who understands that the game will be played and you will be forced to make decisions based on your own due diligence of the company. And I hope I've done a good job of really walking 
walking you guys through what I saw on both the original investor presentation, what it was during the earnings call that I he heard that helped me validate what was being pushed out and what those time frames were for delivery. Back half of 2021, hybrid units will be available. That will be the V2 uh, hybrid option for both the diesel uh, and the CNG. I don't know how the product is gonna do. Freak, I don't know. Are they gonna not sell any to any fleets? Well, they've already proven that they, they, they can sell to fleets, right? They've already proven that there's a strategic niche out there in, in the fleets that they deal with that they are interested in and have received positive feedback about the performance of the product. So it, it becomes very irresponsible for somebody like even myself to come out and say, they're going to kill it. They're going to sell the 300 units that they proposed for 2021 in the original documentation. I, I don't know. I don't know. But I think the cause for delay in the chip shortage and the cause for delay in the process for improvement, I, I think that's reasonable. And I think any reasonable investor can kind of sit back and say, well, they had one of two choices. Either, either they could, could have continued to jam the product through uh, to the fleets, right, with known issues and deal with them at a later time. Or they could deal with the issues right now. And that's exactly what they've done. And I don't see any reason why they're not going to still meet their time frame for the end of 2021 Q3, Q4 rollout of the hybrid availability of the product. It was alluded to um, in the Hylion, the product has a problem and then it won't sell any to fleets, that the hybrid solution is available to customers now. This is not true. Hyleon is taking the final stages to finalize the hybrid product and we'll make those available as appropriate for those uh, specific and strategic installs, both on the diesel side and the CNG side. So we'll see how it rolls out. Th the Hypertruck ERX, as the demos get rolled out to the fleets coming into this year and, and going into the first part of 2022, that's going to be the real key and that I think investors are really going to be given a front seat, no pun intended, to the experience that these drivers and these fleets are having with having that hyper truck out there on the road, under rigor, under stress, under tow, and really testing that reliability from what the fleets are saying that they need. Reliability, cost effective, and driver experience. Those are going to be the three criteria that come back and mirrored with that total cost of ownership element the Hylion is looking to not sell to fleets they're not either you like it or you don't get in line because the first come first serve there's going to be such a demand on this because where companies say they're interested in uh, reducing their carbon footprint customers are demanding the very same thing and the time is now what does it mean for the stock I think, unfortunately, I think the stock is probably going to be subject to the rut, the short selling rut that it's stuck in, unless there is a major catalyst over the next coming into the fall and into the winter. I think, unfortunately, it's going to only take a catalyst to uh, get it above that $10 mark at this point. I have no reason to believe at all. Um, and I hope I'm wrong. I really do. I'm a stock owner in the company. Uh, if it dips too aggressively, I will buy more. Okay. When the company was above uh, ten dollars, eleven, and getting up into the thirteen dollar, I wasn't buying. I had already established my position. So for you guys that are looking at Hylion as a potential viable option for yourself going forward, now's the time to start looking at it. When companies are saying or implying that the company will go bankrupt, or that the company will not sell to fleets. Do your own due diligence, make your own decisions. Really, the only one that you ever have to answer to, if that's your criteria, is yourself. All right, guys, really hope you appreciated this deep dive into Hylion and the Q2 earnings. We did beat my nine cents of four quarters in a row beating earnings. That's a good thing, man. We're stacking up those earnings beats. And I think it's going to take one of these catalysts. We do have two additional earnings, Q3, Q4, uh, for the year ending 2021. Let's give it a little time here, all right? Investing in a company, companies have their own pedigree. They have their own ability to create value. And for stock owners out there, remember the due diligence that you did. 
remember those things that you read on the onset and may have forgotten over time and you start to get distracted a little bit by writers that come on that highly on will not sell a product i beg to differ and i make a stand based on the statistics that i've read and reviewed to say that Hylion absolutely deserves the attention of the large fleets in making sure that the initiative and in marching toward a um, uh, or, and or reducing uh, each individual fleet owner's carbon footprint uh, is, is, is acknowledged. And I think Hylion has a lot of solution out there. Again, they don't have to win the entire industry. We're looking for a small market penetration and Hylion finding that good repeatable business that they can rely upon, grow with, gain that reputation as an industry leader of electrified powertrains. And then it's off and rolling off to global penetration and that's where the key is guys thanks again i really appreciate you tuning in and i hope you enjoyed this deep dive on the q2 uh, earnings for highly on guys thank you so much and good luck in your investment future <laughs>